Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their insights. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review, as it will help others to learn about autism stories. On today's episode, Robin Gow joins me to discuss their new book of poetry, Lanternfly August, managing programs at their local LGBTQ community center, and being a witch. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Robin, thanks so much for joining me here on Autism Stories. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And I wanted to start off by learning where does your story in the autistic community begin? I think that it's a big question because like I, so like I wasn't like identified as being an autistic person until like high school, but I feel like my like story as part of the community is like longer than that because I was in like special education classes since I was very little and also I feel like part of being part of the community is being like having a different relationship to like social norms and things and other folks so I feel like I was always kind of connected but I didn't like understand myself as part of a larger community probably until like college because I just like didn't really address or like think about myself as an autistic person until I like met essentially my college had like a disability organization and it was really a good like learning space for me because it made me feel connected to other disabled people and like I kind of like understood it as more of an identity in like a positive way than I had before. Now you have a new poetry collection out titled Lanternfly August that contends with the emotional geographies of home through the lens of an often demonized species of insect. What do you wish people knew about the lantern fly to maybe reconsider their perspective on this insect? I wish people knew is just like more of a perspective on like what it means to be an invasive species because like it's not like they asked to come <laughs> to where they've existed. And I think that that's like what made me like interested in their story is that and, then, you know, I get really interested in very specific subject matter, <laughs> not at all uncommon for autistic folks, but I got really fascinated by them because I wanted to know, like, how do they live here if they're not from here? And I think that what I would want folks to know is that, like, we it's hard to contend, like, what it means to be a living creature in an area where it doesn't, like, necessarily belong. I think I felt, like, a lot of connection to the lanternfly because they're very beautiful and strange and people don't understand them. And I think that I felt like a connection to being an LGBT person and then also being an autistic person where I often feel like misunderstood and out of place. And that sometimes that makes people react in not nice ways towards me. It's interesting. We have certain species that we, for whatever reason as humans, um, decide to, to demonize. And, and a lot of those, those species are insects. Yeah, definitely. I think that that's one of the reasons why I always love insects. Like when I was younger, I had like a large like insect phase and I really enjoyed like cockroaches, which <laughs> are like, you know, definitely not like a very not appreciated insect, uh, but I was fascinated by them and specifically hissing cockroaches. And I don't know why, but I found them endearing. And I think I've always found a connection to like things that people find gross because I'm like, oh, they're just like a creature too. They just don't look like the stereotypical of like what we think is cute. Right, right. And, you know, one of your poems in Lanternfly August, uh, Cycle, in it you suggest that maybe I'm just my mother's relearned gender, which I think is a really interesting thought. How do you look at the impact uh, or intersection of gender in relation to the relationship we have with those that uh, raised us. Definitely at the heart of this collection of poems, because the book is also really about like growing up in a small rural town and like my family and understanding myself in, in that context, because I think 
oftentimes people think about like LGBTQ people as like not belonging in rural areas or not like associated with rural areas, but I love where I'm from like so much. And so I think when I approach that question through poems, I don't even know if I always have an answer myself. I think I'm like trying to explore all of the different possibilities. So like when I'm approaching a poem, I'm thinking of like, all the different trajectories. And I think it, when I'm like approaching family subject matter, it's not even like I'm necessarily saying that like any family members would have been a different gender if they had given the choice. But sometimes I think about like the specific context that I live in because we are in a time period where there is more access to information on LGBTQ plus identities. And so sometimes I wonder like what options might have my family consider? Do my families feel connected to their genders in the same way that I do, or are have they not been given that space to think about it? As autistic people, being autistic is just one of our many identities. The environment we're from is another really important identity. Now, you mentioned living in a rural area, growing up in a rural life. How do you see that impacting you, especially maybe in relating, in writing um, Lanternfly August? I think that it gave me a lot of space to like be very creative and very imaginative because, and I, I guess I can't speak to other people's experiences, but most of my like young adult life, like young life is, was, I was kind of just like left to my own devices to like run around in cornfields and in nature. And it was one very conducive to me as like very like good for me as an autistic person because I didn't have a lot of outside of like school, I didn't have a lot of like requirements. And so I could kind of just be weird and do whatever I wanted. <laughs> and I think that that's like my approach to poetry. And so I think it definitely really shows up. And then also like a lot of my early, like just immersive interests that I've had that like really show up in these poems. Cause I was really fascinated by agriculture because there's just like farms all around me. And so I would learn about like how people plant and what those cycles look like for planting and harvesting corn and about any kinds of like animals and wildlife. Yeah, I, I grew up in and I've lived in like cities kind of essentially my entire life. So I always find it amazing when I'm out in the country and yeah. <laughs> there's cornfields or there's just this wide open space and it's just like so much space to live. I, I, I find that to be fascinating. Oh yeah, I would just run all around it. I was very, yeah, just adventurous. And I love to like dig in the dirt, find stuff and make all sorts of craft projects and stuff like that. There feels like a, an autonomy to that that you might not get living in like a, a city area. Yeah, definitely. And I think what's interesting is that I really like have experienced my autistic identity in like a variety of ways through that lens too, because like, I think that I didn't feel so like, I don't know, like outside of the world when I was in nature, because I feel like nature itself is like very neurodiverse, you know, <laughs> like it's wild and like all different kinds of things happen. And I felt very at home there in a way I didn't feel at like school or especially not like when I went to college, then I was like more immersed in those systems and I was more like acutely aware of being different. Beyond being a wonderful poet, you manage community programs at your local LGBT community center, building celebratory spaces for uh, the local LGBTQ plus folks. So in what ways do you think are really helpful to support and cele celebrate those with LGBTQ plus and autistic identities? Really, what it really comes down to is like letting folks have spaces that you know, cater to both identities, or I think it's really also like related to just learning more about people who are different than yourself. Like if you're not LGBT, you're not autistic. I've really valued having spaces that are like for LGBTQ plus neurodiverse people. Like I run a group that's called PRISM. PRISM is for LGBTQ plus neurodivergent people. And we just get together and talk about what we are going through things that come up in our lives and having those spaces to share community support is support is really valuable. I guess I just wish people would be open to other people's perspectives, because I think when you learn about someone who's different than yourself, you're usually able to be like, wow, that's something interesting I hadn't considered before. There's often a lot of like negative 
attacks that are specifically directed towards autistic LGBTQ people too. Like an example is there's a lot of anti-LGBTQ bills that are coming out right now. And in some Southern states, they're proposing like not letting a certain like trans folks access gender affirming care. And one of the reasons why people listed as to not was a reason why people can't access it would be being autistic. That, you know, is just an ableist way of like assuming that we don't understand like how to define ourselves as LGBTQ. Autistic people are much more likely than not like to be LGBTQ plus than like any like other populations. And I really just think that that's because our relationship to social norms is different. Like, I think I'm just more willing to question like, why is this the gender I want to be? Or why do I have to be this certain sexuality? Because I don't really care about rules. (laughs) (laughs) As a young person, uh, you gravitated toward uh, witchcraft and now embrace being a witch. So very interested to learn about this. What was it about being a witch that you really kind of initially connected with? It has to do a lot to do with like authority. I was raised in like a pretty strict Catholic household. And I, I mean, connected to what I just said, I've never done super well with like rigid rules that don't like give you any reasons for them. And that made me really not connect with like most organized religion. At the same time, like I do feel like a spiritual person. And I encountered witchcraft probably like early in my college years. And then I started to just like read more and more and develop my own practice. And I think that it suits me very well because it really is what you make it. And it really is, there's not like strict rules. It's like you make the rules that work for you. And there's also like this lack of like, guilt with things because I find a lot of religions are like very much like you didn't do this and you're bad with witchcraft it's like you do what you want to do if you want to cast spells in one way then then that's your practice it's not like a religion in the sense that like Christianity has like a text that people you know the bible that people interpret in some way witchcraft I mean there are texts some people reference like old grimoires and stuff but there's not like a singular text that people are attached to or a singular set of rules that people abide by now, i don't know much about spell work but i do know about <laughs> manifesting the things that you want to kind of come into your physical reality from what i understand you work with demons as your go-to in regards to manifestation so what do you see is the connection of demons and the things that you want to manifest into your life, into your physical reality? So I started working with demons because I think that sometimes my thought is like, maybe the enemy of my enemy is my friend. (laughs) Because I, I was like, how, if I don't trust like what the church that I was raised in, like told me about most things, then maybe what's been told to me about demons isn't true too. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, as a autistic LGBTQ person, I live as somebody who has a lot of demonized identities. And so I was like, maybe I would connect with these beings. And often I've found that working with demons is very healing because you get to connect with like shadow parts of yourself. And by shadow parts, I mean like the parts that we feel maybe like complicated feelings about, or maybe feel guilt, or maybe feel like grief about. And that's really what like demon magic manifests for me. And then when we talk about like manifesting things into the world, I think that demons are really about getting to the root of problems or root of issues. And that has helped me to like address, like if I, so if I'm trying to manifest or like trying to yield in the world, like I, so I'm a writer. So if I want to get like a new book contract or something, doing spell work around that, I find that demons don't respond with being like, you're going to get this big contract. They respond with helping me identify the like root pathways that are going to really get me there so that the work will support what will ultimately yield like a good spell result. So I imagine when, you know, you tell people that you work with demons, they probably have a lot of maybe misconceptions. Like, so what are kind of some myths about demons that like you feel like are, well, that's not true at all. Yeah, well, I think that people think that it's, like, evil. And what I would say is that, I mean, the word demon itself is derived from ancient Greek, and it essentially just means, like, a minor god or a minor spirit. Demons, as, like, entities became demonized as Christianity took over, like, ancient pagan religions. 
And so that's kind of how I understand demons. I don't think that they are like, uh, like evil spirits or anything like that. I don't really believe in evil spirits or good spirits. I think that everything in the world is a mixture of all the things. I also think that they assume that people who work with demons are like always trying to do evil things or something. And I'm not like usually doing any kind of like cursing or hexing or anything like that. And I also think that people think that it might involve like, I don't know, doing bad things like sacrifices or something like that. And I, I mean, like my offerings to demons are usually like a bowl of flowers or like food that I've made or clay objects that I've made. It's a lot more mundane than I think people would think. Now, like some demon magic practitioners might be drawing on like traditions of ceremonial magic, which is a lot more showy involves more like robes and fire and like a big pentacle on the ground um, and a whole other design. But that's that's just like not my approach. I draw from some of those traditions, but not, I don't have a whole room devoted to summoning demons. <laughs> <laughs> and Robin, how can our listeners learn more about and buy your poetry collection, Lantern Fly August? They can get it on my website. I have a link to the publisher to get the book. And on my website, you can also see anything else that I'm working on. And if you're interested in just seeing what I'm doing with writing, I have a TikTok that's for all of my writing and such. And I also have a TikTok where I talk about demon magic. So if that was interesting to you, there's also a TikTok <laughs> for that. Well, Robin, I really appreciate you making time to talk with me today. There's a lot of interesting things about you that we didn't even get into, um, but we could, I think we probably could have had, we could have you back maybe some other time to talk about that. But thanks so much for joining me today. And hopefully people go out and, and purchase copies of Lanternfly August. Thank you so much for having me and for your really amazing, thoughtful questions. This was great. Thanks so much to Robin for the conversation. To learn more about Robin and their book, Lanternfly August, please check out the link in the podcast description for this episode. Here at Autism Personal Coach, our clients are the experts, our coaches are the guides. The majority of supports for autistics are not helpful. They try to fix us, not support us. That's why many are confused when we say our clients are the experts, experts of their lived experience. Our clients are the experts for what's worked for them and about the things that they need and want in their lives. Our coaches first listen to our clients and then ask thoughtful questions, offer resources, and strategize with our clients so they can get what they need to thrive. Would you want a guide in your life to coach you to get you the things you desire? If so, then visit AutismPersonalCoach.com for more information. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories. And if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone you know about it so they could have the same enjoyable and educational experience as you when listening to Autism Stories, it would be very much appreciated. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.